Hey everyone, this is Professor Rossetti with another screencast, this time for the shopping cart project, which is our first project. On the screen you see a moving demonstration of a solution to this project. Essentially the business prompt is for us to create a Python application which will facilitate a business's checkout process whereby a customer, a customer might arrive with some grocery items and a checkout clerk will scan them at the counter and this application will create will automatically create a receipt to share with the customer and to prompt them with the total amount that they owe so this is a python application that will facilitate a business's checkout process and here we go so in the first screencast for the groceries exercise I use the github.com online interface as a tool for version control purposes, but in this project I will use the GitHub desktop software for a version control tool. I'll share a link in the show notes about where to download this application from, but once you download the GitHub desktop software, you should be able to uh, open it up and then sign in which I will do now and I'll pause the video and I'll replay it after I've continued signing in. All right, so I've signed in to the GitHub desktop software and now we're ready to go. Our first step in our development process for this project is to create on github.com a new remote project repository. So anywhere on github.com, you can navigate to the top right, this plus icon, and we'll say new repository. And we'll name our project repository something related to shopping cart. So I might say shopping cart screencast. And then importantly, we want to initialize the repository with a readme. It just makes some of our operations a lot easier and when we're done let's say create this repository so now we have a place a repository for our project code to reside and now we're ready to download or clone this remote project repository onto our local computers so we can begin the development process so if you're using uh, if you're using git from the command line you would note there's a remote address here otherwise since we're using github desktop software there's also a button for you to open this repository with the github desktop software and you can feel free to click this button I'll do this an alternative way through the github desktop software and uh, you can feel free to do either one of these ways, either clicking open in desktop or open up your GitHub desktop software and we can click this button at the top right here that says clone a repository from the internet. And after we do, we get to search for a repository. And so you might need to refresh if you've just recently created your remote repository and after the refresh happens, you should be able to see this new repository that you created. And one important thing to note is where we will be downloading this repository to our computer. So it's possible for us to choose a location on our computer. I'll just choose the desktop. but you can feel free to choose wherever works for you. Just remember where, uh, where to, where you downloaded it from, where you downloaded it to. Okay, so we have this repository downloaded locally. I see some buttons that are asking me whether I wanna open this repository in my text editor, and I will wanna do that Although I'm not using Atom as a text editor, I'm using VS Code. So let's see if we can customize the preferences of this GitHub desktop software to um, recognize our chosen text editor of VS Code. 
So I'll just choose preferences, advanced, and it looks like we get to choose a text editor. I'll choose Visual Studio Code just because that's the text editor that I'm using. Okay. After I do that, this button changes to prompt me to open this repository in my chosen text editor, VS Code, and that's what I'll do now. Otherwise, you could just, uh, there are other ways for you to open this local project repository in your text editor. But once we do open our project repository in the text editor, we see the readme file that got created and we're ready to go. So now that we have set up our project repository, both a remote version of it on github.com and a local version on our desktop or on our computer somewhere, we're ready to begin the development process. So let's open up our command line application. For me, I'm going to be using the terminal on my Mac. And let's navigate to our local project repository. For me, it's on my desktop. So I'll change directories to the desktop and into my project repository. Here, I have the option of uh, creating a new virtual environment. So let me do that now. Conda create a new virtual environment named uh, shopping env. We won't be installing any Python packages, but uh, I'll just create a new virtual environment anyway just to get in the habit of doing so. And after doing so, I'll activate the virtual environment. And from within, I will invoke the Python command line utility to run my Python script, which doesn't exist yet. So let's now create a new Python script for us to write our program. In my text editor, I'll right click in the Explorer pane and say new file. And I'll name my Python program shopping underscore cart dot py. And inside I'll place some Python code, like print hello. And just, I'll uh, test out my ability to run this script by saying Python, and then passing in the name of this script. So Python shopping cart.py, pressing enter, we see hello. Okay, great, I think we've reached a milestone. We've uh, set up this project repository. We might wanna commit at this time. But uh, before we do, there's maybe some more starter code that we can include in our project repository. Let's take a look back at the project description on github.com to see if there's any other starter code that we might want to use. I'll leave it to you to read through the requirements, but I might copy some of these requirements into my program just so I remember what they are and so I can translate them easily. So I want all these elements to be in my program and uh, we'll probably revisit these later. Otherwise, is there any other code that uh, I can use to start this project? It looks like we are gonna be using this starter code right here. So I'll paste this into my Python file and maybe we'll print products and that's how we will start the setup for this uh, project. So I'm going to navigate back into my GitHub desktop software and we see the changes that I made are reflected. We have this new Python file and I'm also gonna make some quick changes to my readme file. And after I do, we'll make our first commit. All right, so I have made some changes to my readme file. I've just written in Markdown to provide someone with instructions on A, where they might find the project description, how they might install this program, and how they might run this program. And that's good enough for me for now as a setup for this repository. And we see in the GitHub desktop software, we see our changes reflected. So we see this new shopping cart Python file, and we see some revisions to our uh, readme file, which is gonna provide instructions. And so I think we're, we've reached a milestone. We have 
set up this project repository to start development. So I'm going to make my first commit and I'll, I'll give a message of something like uh, set up project repository. And I'll commit. And so we've seen this already, but just to put a point on it, we've made these commits locally and they have not yet been uh, synced up to our remote repository. So every so often, whether it's after every single commit or after a few commits or whatever feels good for you, you want to push your changes up to the remote repository on GitHub so that they'll be reflected there. Before we push our changes, our remote repository will not reflect those changes. Here we see just our original readme file, but after we push our changes and sync our local and remote repositories, we should be able to uh, visit our project repository again on github.com and now we see the changes reflected. So we have um, made a local commit and we've synced it up to GitHub and we're ready to continue with project development. So let's turn our attention back to the project requirements and think conceptually about what our next step should be. We know from the project requirements and by viewing this moving demonstration of the project solution that there's two main sub steps or sub components involved. There's this information input process or information capture process whereby we ask the user for uh, a number of product identifiers representing the products selected by the customer in their shopping cart. That's the first component that we need to think about. How will we capture all of these product identifiers and store them so that we could use them later? Second, we want to take the captured product identifiers and use them to perform some calculations. For example, we want to look up each item's price and uh, assemble a running total of the, of the price and then calculate some tax and total costs at the end. So we could start with the first process, the user input or capture process, or we could skip that and start with the uh, display process. It's up to you on which approach you'd like to use, but for the purpose of this screencast, I will start with uh, I'll just go in order. First, we will ask the user for a number of inputs, and then we will use those inputs. So that's my approach. That's my strategy. I think it's important that we uh, think about a strategy before we try to start coding a solution. But now let's start coding a solution for the first part of our project, which is this information capture process. How will we ask the user for a number of product identifiers. Ready? Let's dive in. So here's my program and right now I have some placeholder reminders about what we need to print out at the end. I'll remember those later and right now I'd like to focus on something else. So I'm just going to create some sections in my code to represent these two different processes that I talked about. Like here, some uh, information capture. And here's some information display or output. Information inputs and information outputs. That's how I'm separating my understanding of the processes involved in this project. OK, so when we display the final receipt, we'll have to take all of this into consideration. But let's turn our focus, or let's focus right now on what we need to do just in order to capture some user inputs. We talked about in class already how we can use a special built-in Python function called the input function to capture user inputs. When we do, the parameter of this function is a textual message that we'd like to pass on to the user. So in this case, I'll say, please, input a product identifier. And let's test out our program to see how it's working. Uh, 
okay, I ran my script and it's asking me for an identifier. I'll choose identifier number nine. Okay, great. I pressed enter. Now our program ended. It's not doing anything with this input yet, but we're at least capturing this input. So we're moving in the right direction. Before I move on, I would like to ask more. I would like to ask the program more information about this input that's getting captured. Specifically, I'm curious, what data type is this? So we know how to work with this input. I guess in order to store the input into a variable so we can use it later, we'll have to uh, do just that. So we could, let's uh, use a variable called like selected ID, for example, and uh, we will store the results of our input process in that variable. And then afterwards, I would like for the program to just print out the value and the data type of that captured value. So let's print not only the value, but also its data type. And by asking about the data type, we can learn more about how we should expect to operate using this value. So I'm going to run my program again. Please input a product identifier. Okay, I'll say product number nine and say enter. And here I learn that the input is of a string data type. This might not be intuitive because I input the number nine, like I literally press the number nine on my keyboard and press enter, but Python is interpreting that as a string. This behavior is something we'll have to internalize. It's how the input function works. And we'll need to remember that this value is a string when we're working with this value. So I'm just gonna make a note for myself, like this is a string version of the number nine. All right, I'm feeling comfortable and ready to move on. I think at this time I'd like to make a commit or save my progress. We have asked the user for an input and that's a significant step. So it's a good excuse as any to commit our code. So I will go, I'll navigate back to my GitHub desktop software where I see the changes that I've made reflected in my Python file. I see that there is, there are some red lines like lines removed and some green lines that were added and that reflects my understanding of the updates to this program. So I'm going to make my commit now with a message of something like uh, 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 capture user input. All right, we're doing something. We're gonna make a commit. So let's continue developing our program. We don't want to just display the identifier and its data type. We actually want to take this input and go look up a product based on whatever that input is. I know there's some kind of looping action that we'll need to implement. I'm not exactly sure if I wanna go there yet, but what I do know that I need to do with any given input, any given product identifier, is to be able to look up the matching product. So my question to myself now is, can I do that? Let me demonstrate my ability to look up a product given a single identifier. And then if I can do that, then maybe I can further adapt that to uh, look up all the products that were uh, input. So our goal right now is given this selected identifier like the number nine, how can we return the corresponding product from our list of products? Even if these products were misordered or let's say some of them were uh, missing or deleted. We want to actually ask which of these dictionaries, which of these products in our list of products has an, identi an ID attribute of whatever selected uh, identifier uh, the user specified. So conceptually what we want to be doing here is we have a given product identifier like nine and our question is, okay, which item in our products list matches that identifier? 
And so what we hope to have happen is we would like to return this entire product dictionary corresponding with the identifier that was captured. All right, so that's what we want to have happen. So like we want a matching product here. We need to somehow find the matching product given our selected identifier. How are we gonna do this? Here's where I'd like to turn your attention to the notes about list data types. We know that our products variable is a list. It contains items and we want to select a certain subset of those items that match some given condition. So there are some notes that I've provided for you to help you uh, understand some options that you have available. Let's head on over to the course repository. Our, uh, our, uh, we'll, we'll navigate to the notes about lists. So I'm just gonna use the file finder here and I will type the word list and hopefully it will correspond with some file about lists. Here we go. Some notes, Python, data types, lists. So if you read through this document about lists, you'll find a lot of helpful information, but it's this specific section about filtering, which will provide us with some options about how we can uh, select a subset of the items that we have in our list a subset of items matching some given condition. So we already took a look at some of these options in the groceries exercise screencast. And we already talked about one of these options in class. It's the list comprehension technique. And it's this list comprehension technique that I will use here as well. So I see some notes about this list comprehension and we talked about it in class. So, um, I won't talk about it too much other than to just see how we would adapt it for the purposes of using it in our program. So let's try to adapt this list comprehension technique. Can we say some matching product uh, is equal to the results of our list comprehension? Let's try this out. We'll want to adapt this list comprehension so that it's suiting our purpose. And then after, let's see if we can print out the result. So like what will our matching product be and what will its data type be? So after we try to adapt this code to meet our purpose, we'll run the program again and we will take a look at the results of our efforts, okay? So we're not dealing with teams, we're dealing with products here and we have no choice but to use our list, our existing products list as the list that we want to filter in some way. So we have to use it here. But now we have a choice about what we call each item in our list of products. Before when we're looping through each item in our list of products, we said for each item in our list of items, do something with that item, we said like, for P in products, like print P or something like that. So what I'll do is I'll use that same familiar um, variable name P here to reference each item in our list of products. We'll say uh, return an item for each item in our list of items if some condition is met. No longer do we have cities. City is not an attribute of this product dictionary, but we do have these other attributes like ID, name, and department, etc. And it is the ID attribute that we want to try to compare. Like, hey, is, is our given product identifier equal to the ID value of one of these, one or more of these product dictionaries? That's the kind of question we'll want to be asking. So we'll want to be keying in on this ID attribute of any given product dictionary. So we're almost done assembling our condition here, our filter condition. Return a return each product dictionary for each product dictionary in our list of products if the product dictionary's ID attribute is equal to some value. Here, we want to match it with our selected ID. 
So I think that's a good step forward. So as I internalize this, what I think this is going to do is it's going to compare our the product identifier of each product in the list to our number nine. And if any product identifiers match that number nine, it will return those products to our variable that we've called matching products. Let's try this out. Please input a product identifier. Okay, number nine. Okay, we see some things happening here. We see that a list is returned and it's an empty list. So this isn't what we expected. We can infer that something is not right with our, our condition in our list comprehension. No items are matching the condition that we specified. So we'll want to look into our filter condition now. Something about this condition is not selecting the product that we hope gets returned. We hope that this product here gets returned, uh, blueberry yogurt, because it has an ID of nine. This nine is an integer, and this selected ID is a string. So maybe it's something about comparing those different data types that Python is saying uh, these aren't equal to each other. Let's test this out really quickly. I'm just going to drop into a Python console. And uh, so here we have access to all of our Python language capabilities, like we could add things. But here's where I want to test out my understanding of how Python is going to uh, compare two values. So for example, does 9, is that equal to 9? True. Okay. That reflects my understanding. What about if one of these is a string version of 9? Does that, is that going to be true or false? Okay, that's going to be false and is because the integer version of 9 does not equal the string version of 9, that's why none of our products got returned. That's why this filter condition that we specified of our our integer product ID, comparing that against our string selected identifier, there's no match there. So we'll want to perform this comparison using two values of the same data type, and maybe that will help us out. So just to, uh, to further demonstrate this point, we have two options here to convert each of these values uh, to a data type, which will allow them to be compared. First is we can compare them both as integers. Second, we could compare them both as strings. It's up to you on what you'd like to do. If you want to compare them both as integers, you could uh, convert the string to an integer. You could convert both of them to an integer to be safe about it. Uh, otherwise, if you wanted to compare them both as strings, you could convert the, the integer to a string, and that will compare successfully, or you can convert both values to be safe about it. I think I'll probably be safe about it. I'll convert both values to a string just so that I'm confident my comparisons will be comparing values of like data types. That's one of the tricky parts of using the input function is just recognizing that these values are going to be strings and we have to handle them accordingly. So I will convert both of these values to a string just to be safe about making sure our conversion, excuse me, our comparison is happening in a way that we expect. All right, let's try this program out again and see if we've fixed our filter condition. All right, please input a product identifier, product number nine, here we go. Okay, this time we see a successful match no longer is our list empty. No longer did our filter condition not match any items in our list, but this time our filter condition did return some matching items and specifically one single matching item. We can assume that at most our filter condition will return at most one matching item because the project description says we can assume that each of the product identifiers is unique.
So we don't have to worry about more than one product being uh, considered as a match in our filter condition. But we do see that we're still getting a list back. We're not getting this specific matching product. So there's another step that we need to do to select the first item from this matching products list. So what we'll do to finish off our ability to look up a product given a selected identifier is uh, we'll recognize that a list comprehension will return a list, whether it's empty or it has one item in it or many items. And so what I'll do here with my variable name is make it plural to reflect that understanding. It's matching products is going to be a list. And in order to select the first item in that list, we can reference that item by its index, its numeric position, which will be zero for the first item. So here we can say matching product singular equals the first matching product. And now if we wanted to print the matching product and its data type, we'll see that it is a dictionary. So let's run this and try it out. Please input a product identifier. Okay, number nine. All right, here we see now that we're taking the first item in our matching products list and we've identified that dictionary as our matching product. And we see that, yeah, we, we have gotten a dictionary back. Okay, great. So what have we done so far? We have prompted the user for a selected identifier. And then we've used that selected identifier to look up um, all of the products matching that identifier, which at most will be one given the business prompt and how these identifiers are unique. And then we uh, select the first matching product, store that in a variable that we call matching product. Now, finally, if we wanted to display the price and name of that matching product, we could do that in a very similar way as we did in the groceries exercise. So we could print, uh, something like selected product and then let's concatenate it with its name and also its price and after we do this we will demonstrate our ability to access certain attributes of this matching product dictionary and then we could uh, take a next step in development from there. But before we do, let's test this out and see if it works. Oh no, can only concatenate strings? Okay, I should know this by now that I need to convert numbers to strings when I'm concatenating them. All right, let's try this again. Cool, so we've input product number nine and the program detects that we've selected this uh, blueberry yogurt product. Let's run a few more tests to make sure that our program can detect any identifier that we provide like four smart ones, rig, mini rigatoni. Let's take a look. Product with the ID number four. All right. So our program is taking a selected identifier and it's looking up a matching product. And I think that's a really great milestone. So let's commit our code. So I navigate to my GitHub desktop software and I review the changes. It looks like we have used a list comprehension to assemble a list of matching products and then we are taking the first product of, from there and we are printing its name and price. All right, that reflects my understanding of the changes that we made. So I'll make a commit now to save our changes and I'll make a mess a commit message of something like uh, look up product given identifier. All right. So I've made a commit and I'll just take this opportunity to push my changes up to github.com so that uh, we should see them reflected on github.com. Let's take a look real quick. In my shopping cart file. All right, here we're using like a list comprehension. Looks good. All right. So Let's now think about what our next effort should be.
we see that we are prompting the user for a product identifier once, but we know from the project description that we would like for the user to be able to do that as many times as they wish. And then once they're done, they can input the keyword of done, and that will stop the process. So let's try to implement this final part of our, of our user input and our information capture process of this project. All right, so we are performing this lookup once, but we really want to do this multiple times. We talked about in class already how we could use a loop for this purpose. We're going to use a while loop, and as long as some condition is met, the code inside the loop will continue to execute. So if we indent all of this code inside of our new while loop, as long as this condition right here is set to true, this will be in, this condition will always be true, so the loop will be infinite. And let's see this in action real quick. It won't be exactly what we want it to do. We'll want to somehow stop the loop, but this is as fine of a next step as any. So let's test this out. We'll first enter product nine. Okay, it looks like that lookup went successful. All right, what about product four? Okay, that's successful. Product two, okay, it's gonna keep asking me for different products. And it looks like this is happening all the way we would expect, but when we say done, uh, something is not happening here as we would want it to happen. We're seeing some kind of uh, error message here. And what's going on is it's trying to look up the word done and try to find a matching product identifier, but there's no matching product identifier. So we want to stop the program before it even does something like this. Let's see how we could conditionally detect whether or not the user has specified a keyword of done. And if so, we will stop the loop. Uh, if not, we'll continue the loop and we'll continue to ask for new product identifiers. So here, Here's where we're already asking the user to input a product ID and storing the result in a variable called selected ID. It's possible that this could be not only nine, but it's possible it could be the word done. And if it is the word done, then we'll want to stop the loop. Otherwise, we will want to perform this process that's being performed. So we could use a simple if statement to handle this condition. So we'll say if selected ID is equal to, definitely using that double equal sign, the word done, then we'll do something. What will we do? Uh, we will stop the loop and we'll use a, a special keyword called break to do this. There's notes in the project uh, checkpoints about the break keyword. If you weren't familiar familiar with that keyword already, but essentially break will say, hey, we're, we're in some loop, let's break out of it and stop it. If the selected ID is equal to done, let's break out of the loop. Otherwise, let's do exactly what we were doing. Let's look up that matching product, okay? So let's try this out. If it works, it works. If it doesn't, we just have to fix it. Nine, three, one, two, done. Nice, okay, the program stopped. That's awesome. I think this is a significant milestone. We've handled the done signal, so let's commit our code. Going back to the GitHub desktop online, excuse me, GitHub desktop software. Here we see no longer are we asking the user once for a product identifier and looking it up, but we're doing that lookup iteratively for each passing of our loop and conditionally only if the selected identifier is not equal to our done keyword. So I th what are we doing here? We are uh, iteratively prompting the user for inputs and handling the done keyword. So I'll make a commit message that reflects that. Okay, so I've made my commit message, great. Now let's continue developing our project.
So we are displaying the names of each matching product, but we have not yet started to keep a running total of the cost of all of these items. So what I'd like to do next is for us to be able to display, for example, the total price of all these items that we select. Uh, after our loop, I'm just going to create a new variable for this purpose, and I'll call it uh, total price or something like that. What we want to do is print the total price. This will be like a receipt total. So when our program finishes execution, we'll see the total um, amount that the customer owes. So for example, if we say products three, then two, then one, we should expect the total to be 249 plus 499 plus 350, whatever that is. But right now we just see zero. So what we need to have our program do is uh, add up all these prices. There's a lot of ways we can do this, but what I think I'd like to do is keep a running total of our prices and within our loop just keep adding to that running total with each selected item. So in order to do that we'll need to define our variable somewhere above the loop and within the loop after we find the matching product here's where we can accumulate the value of our total price and keep adding each product price to our total so that by the time the loop is finished all of our selected product prices will be uh, added up there. So we went over this in class but what we can say is the new value of our total price variable is equal to whatever its previous value was plus our matching products price. Let's try this out. So we start with the total price is zero. When our loop uh, iterates through our matching products and we've uh, identified which product matches the selected identifier, we can uh, add its price to our running total list of prices. And after the loop finishes, we'll print out that total price. We'll probably have to also format as USD, but I'll leave that for you to do later. Let's try this out. Three, two, one, done. Total price, 10.98. Uh, we could do some calculations to see whether that's right. I'm just gonna assume that it is right. All right, what have we done? We've uh, summed up a running total list of prices. So I think that's as good of a time to commit as any. So uh, assemble running total price is gonna be my commit message and I will make this commit. And after I do, I'm just gonna push up to GitHub again every so often. So now that we've pushed our code to GitHub, let's continue to develop this project. We notice that it looks like we're doing a lot of what is involved in the project description, but it's not happening in the exact order that the project is uh, describing for us. Here we see in the demonstration that Every time the user inputs a selected identifier, um, the program is just gonna say, okay, I get that identifier, what's the next one? But right now our program is immediately looking up the product. I think we need to just change up the order in which our program is operating. We want these lookups to happen after all of the product identifiers have been assembled. So we'll take a little bit of a different approach to just kind of uh, create a different experience. Right now we are uh, printing out the names and prices of each of these products like ex uh, immediately after the user inputs them, but we really want to wait until the end, and that's when we can print out this receipt in one place. Okay, that's our goal right now. So, we don't want to be printing out the selected product each time. We probably 
still do want to be accumulating its price, but uh, we'll want to loop through all of our selected products after we ask the user for some identifier. What I'm going to do is I'm going to split up this process into two processes. The first process is only going to ask the user for selected identifiers and it will store all of the selected identifiers in a list. Then the second process will take those identifiers that are stored in the list and it will perform the lookups and print out the, the prices and, and uh, keep a running total of the price. So I'm going to separate these two processes out. In the same way that I created a, an initial variable to store the running total of the price, I'd also like to store an initial variable, excuse me, to define an initial variable to store our product identifiers. So here I'll say uh, selected IDs, plural, and I'll start it off as an empty list. And now, instead of performing this entire matching process here, I will just uh, add our selected identifier to our list so that uh, after our loop finishes, we'll still have access to our list. Let's see this in action. I guess uh, I'll just comment this stuff out. What we want to have happen is like, uh, let's just display a list of our selected products. So we can say print our selected IDs, plural. And uh, this, is, this will be a list, so we can use a certain operation called append to add a new item to the list. So what we'll do is here we will append our selected identifier to our running total like list of selected IDs such that when the loop ends, our selected IDs list will be populated with items. Let's try this out. We're no longer, we've kind of commented out our lookup approach. We'll have to reinstore this. Re, we'll have to restore this, reinstate this somewhere. But uh, let's take a look and see how our program is operating right now. All right, we're being prompted for some identifiers. And when we say done, all right, now it looks like we have stored those identifiers for further use. Okay. So knowing that we've stored the identifiers for further use, now I think is where later on we can loop through them and do a, a similar lookup process as what we were just doing. So let's implement this. We can, instead of printing out all of the selected identifiers, let's use a handy for loop to say for each identifier in our list of selected identifiers, do something with that ID. So for, I'll say uh, ID or maybe uh, selected ID, not sure, but we definitely want to use selected IDs as our list that we want to loop through. So for each selected ID, let's do something. What will we do? We'll perform this lookup process. And do pretty much the same thing as what we were doing before, but instead of doing it in line of uh, in the same kind of process as our information capture process, we can separate this out into its own process so that it happens afterwards. Um, let's see, I guess the only way we're gonna know if this works is by running it. Let's try it out. Three, two, one, done. Okay, this is much more closely resembling our final output where we see the receipt prints after the user is done selecting their items. Okay, cool. So at this time, I'll probably leave it up to you to finish the rest of this project. Uh, there's just some details left about, hey, you need to print a grocery store name of choice and a, uh, a date time of when the checkout process started. We already talked about some of this in class. You'll also have to calculate some tax and then like print a friendly message at the end, but I think you can tackle all these things. The hardest parts of this project are what I just demonstrated. So I will make a final commit, and then we'll stop the screencast. All right, reviewing the code using the GitHub desktop software, it looks like we commented out some lines inside of our loop, 
instead of doing this lookup process in our loop, we're going to do it later after our loop stops. And we're able to perform the lookups on those selected identifiers because we've stored them in some list, which we can loop through later. All right, this looks good. So how does this differ from last time? I guess we're printing the receipt at the end. I guess we're separating the capture and display processes. Okay, commit messages. Very important to figure out what you want to say. All right, anyway, so now you can take a look at my code up on GitHub. I will be um, revising it to finish the project most likely and you could take a look at that but at least hopefully this screencast is helpful for you to answer some questions about the harder pro parts of this project. All right with that this has been a screencast of the shopping cart project. Have a great weekend. I'll see you in class.